Thank you. Thank you, George, for that lovely rendition of William Green's The Power in You. Hello, and thank you for joining us today for From Idea to MVP. I'm Denise Griffin with Georgia State University's Entrepreneurship Innovation Institute. ENI blends education and application through a variety of offerings, such as undergraduate and graduate courses, panel and guest speaker events, challenges, competitions, students, a living learning community, and a co working space where students can work on their businesses and ideas called Launch GSU. Many of you probably have heard of it. Let me introduce you to today's guest speaker. I think you will be impressed as I was. Michael Shingbush is the CEO and founder of Elitech, or Elitype, excuse me, a marketing technology company based in Atlanta and located at Atlanta Development, Develop, excuse me, Atlanta Tech Development Center, or better known ATDC. Previously, Michael was the entrepreneur in resident at ATDC and the CTO of Bright Whistle. Michael is a mentor and advisor to many Atlanta area technology startups and specializes in product development and design. So you see why we chose him for today's topic. He's also a Georgia Tech grad and lives with his family in the Johns Creek area. All right, thank you for having me. Today's session is entitled From Idea to MVP. And over the course of my career in software development and mentoring many of Atlanta's uh, technology companies, one of the ideas and one of the topics I'm most passionate about is helping non-technical founders really take their idea and figure out, do we need to build a product? And if so, what's the best way to do it in the most cost effective and efficient manner? And so in today's discussion, what I hope we can get through is I want to answer the question for everybody, you know, does my business need a product? And if so, how do I go about building it? And today's agenda, we're going to cover four different topics. The first one is we're going to try to answer the question, should we build a product? If we are going to build a product and we want to take on an MVP, what can we learn from an MVP? What are the expectations that we're going to have? How does an MVP end and what comes after an MVP? And then we're going to talk about some tips and tricks on how to build an MVP in a way that's going to be most cost efficient and effective for you. Now, for the sake of this webinar today, we're going to use the term product to mean software and not physical products. Now, a lot of the concepts that we're going to talk about today can apply to physical product development. But for the most part, we're going to talk about building technology products or building software products. Now, I wish we could all be together in the same room. I usually like to make these talks very collaborative in front of a class or in front of a, uh, a seminar where we can share ideas and talk and have it be more conversational. Unfortunately, we're all remote. We're all at home today. Um, so we do want to take questions. And rather than waiting till the end to take questions, um, Post questions in the Q&A section, and there's going to be a couple points during the talk where we'll pause to answer any questions there. So if we're talking about a, if I'm talking about a topic where you have a question about, go ahead and put that in the Q&A section. And when we pause, I'll address those questions kind of as they come in. So to start, let's talk about what's the definition. When we talk about a minimum viable product, what do we mean, or at least what are we, how are we using the term today? So the definition that I like, this is my definition, there's lots of definitions out there, but an MVP is the minimum version of a product that enables you to get feedback from potential customers. So we've highlighted a few words here, right? So first, emphasis on minimum. We're gonna talk about that a lot today. How do we keep costs down? How do we develop the bare minimum functionality in order to actually get feedback from potential customers? And again, another key word, we're not at the point yet where we have actual customers we want to talk about potential customers because part of this process is going to involve iteration. We want to use that feedback to iterate on the product, allowing us to continually test the viability of the product across multiple possible customer segments. So at this point in our uh, business model, 
we may not know exactly who we're selling to yet. We may have an idea. We want to test that out. So we want to have a minimum viable product where we can go to multiple different types of customers, get their feedback, and use that feedback to not only tailor the requirements of the product, but try to figure out who we actually want to sell the product to when we move on to a version one. So before we get started, we sent out a few links uh, before the class. And if you had a chance to look at those, call these prerequisites, but I'm going to review them real quickly here in case you didn't have a chance. But there's three topics that I'd love everybody to be familiar with before we move forward. The first one is your business model canvas. This is often taught in many uh, you know, business uh, and management classes and entrepreneurial uh, classes. We'll cover that briefly. We'll talk a little bit about some of the methodology that's involved in lean startup. So my background is primarily in technology, primarily in startups, but lean startup methodology has been applied to many different types of businesses. So we're gonna review that methodology real quickly. And then finally, one of the phrases that I love the most is do things that don't scale. And MVPs are all about doing things that don't scale in order so that we can build a product that will scale later on. So let's start with the first one, the business model canvas. Um, everybody's probably familiar with this. You may have seen it. If you haven't, we'll send. You can obviously Google it and you can look at it. Um, but a business model canvas is a great way to vet your idea, test your hypothesis, understand who your target market is, how the cost structures are going to work, how you can get potential revenue, who the potential customer segments are, more importantly, kind of what the value prop is. And the interesting thing about this business model canvas is the word product is only mentioned once. There's this little sentence here, what bundles of products and services are we offering to each customer segment? Kind of leaves out a lot when it comes to, do we need to build the product? Are we going to acquire the product? Are we gonna partner for the product? Um, not a lot of the business model canvas has much to do with product development. So hopefully today's session helps fill in some of those gaps. One of the ways we can fill in that gap is when we talked about the lean startup. So the idea of an MVP in the lean startup methodology is from a book from Eric Reese. He defines an MVP as a version of a product which allows a team to collect the maximum amount of validated learning about customers with the least amount of effort. And the lean startup methodology has really three pieces that I think uh, if you can read the book, great, or if you can just get the cliff notes, even better, but there's three main topics. The first one is the concept of an MVP. And when it comes to software development, how do we use what's called continuous delivery to create many different iterations of that product to kind of test our hypothesis out? How do we revise our hypothesis? How do we test? And then how do we get what he calls actionable metrics, I call that feedback, okay? So an actual metric is what are we measuring um, in terms of success with the product? Um, that's just feedback, that's tangible feedback. So I strongly recommend if anybody needs a summer reading book, pick this one up. And then finally, we'll review real quickly the concept of do things that don't scale. Um, if you're familiar with Paul Graham, he's the co-founder of Y Combinator. Y Combinator is one of the predominant startup incubators and accelerators uh, in the country. Very prominent guy and has, the, has a, had a very influential blog post called Do Things That Don't Scale. And you can read it here. I put the link here. We sent that out, obviously, uh, before the session today. But there's really three things that I think are really uh, great takeaways for this session. The first one is test in a very narrow market. Think big, but launch small and do things manually, okay? And this all goes back to how we're gonna develop our MVP, our minimum viable product. We wanna test in a very narrow market. We wanna have big ideas, but we wanna launch in small markets, test small. And then anything that we can do manually, we're gonna do manually until we can't do it anymore because we don't wanna overinvest in something that's supposed to be the minimum. And there's a concept that comes out of do things that don't scale, or there's a, a term that you may have heard of. It's called the mechanical Turk. And I wanted to mention it here because it's a great classic example of doing things that don't scale. And it's a great historical reference to what we want to achieve in an MVP. If you've ever heard the term of a mechanical Turk, the mechanical Turk was a device that played chess. And what happened was a person actually sat inside the box 
And the brain and the intelligence was actually done by a person. But from the outside, the audience thought it was a machine that was doing it. So this is a great concept to think about when it comes to building a minimum viable product. We're doing things manually behind the scenes, but we're showing an idea that we want to get people interested in, that we want people to uh, eventually buy, and we want to test the market for our product. And we can do that in ways that are cheap, that are effective, that oftentimes involve a lot of manual process, but can appear to be more than it is. And that's the idea of an MVP. Let's iterate on it. Let's create something that we can get feedback on. But before we go down that approach, we want to ask this question, should we even build a product? Okay. So first and foremost, product development is expensive and time consuming. It's one of the most expensive pieces or parts about your business, uh, business model and about your business development. Now we're gonna start here with the assumption that we've identified a problem that needs solving. That's a big part of the business model canvas, identifying the problem, identifying a target market, testing your hypothesis, interviewing customers. And we're gonna assume that we've done that and we are met with the question, after we've interviewed potential customers to test this value problem, how do we know if building a product is the right solution? And we're gonna start by saying, we're not always sure if it is the right the solution. So before we go down this path, we want to ask the question, you know, does a product already exist? And this may seem self-explanatory, but let's walk through it real quick. There's really three answers here. Does a product already exist that I'm envisioning? Well, it's either going to be, yes, there is, no, there isn't, or sort of, kind of in between. So let's talk it out real quick. Is there a product out there? If there is a product, we have to ask the question, why would your product be better, cheaper, faster, or easier to use? This is exactly how innovation usually works in technology. There's already something out there that does it, but we're gonna introduce a new piece of technology that enables us to deliver a similar product, but in a way that's cheaper, faster, or easier to use than the competing products. So we already know that there's a market out there, but we're gonna develop a product that makes it better. That's the classic definition of innovation. It's not invention, that's innovation. If there's not a product out there, we have to ask why not? Why doesn't this product exist? And there's really only two answers for that. Either you're the first person to do it, or maybe it's not a good idea. So this is the difference between being truly, in, uh, being truly inventive and then maybe stumbling across a bad idea. So we need to test that. If you're looking to build a product that doesn't already exist in any way, shape or form, we wanna challenge that assumption. Are we the first person to do this? Or maybe should we question that? Maybe that's a bad sign. That has to do the same thing with competitors. So often if you try to pitch an idea to a potential investor, they say, who's your competitors? You say, I don't have any competitors at all. That is the worst answer you could possibly have. Because if no one's doing this yet, maybe the market hasn't been tested, maybe it hasn't been validated yet. So let's test that assumption if there's no product that's already out there. Now in the middle, this is the one where I think we see a lot of things are. Uh, a lot of products fall into this space. Sort of, and usually that sounds like this. This product already exists over there, so naturally it should work over here. So a product's maybe been developed, it's been proven, it's been tested, and it works for a certain industry. Why can't we take that same idea and apply it to a different industry? It's very logical, lots of businesses work that way. In fact, you'll often hear the terms like, well, what are you building? Well, we're gonna be the Uber for X or we're gonna be the Airbnb for Y. Those analogies work great. It's a really easy way to explain how you're gonna go after a new market using an existing approach or an existing type of product somewhere else. So we wanna walk our idea through these process, you know, through these kind of three ideas to see if we should actually build this product. And because it's so expensive to build a product, we always want to encourage and consider alternatives to building a product. And I can't stress this enough. This is uh, through many, many years of experience doing this. Oftentimes to deliver the value to your potential customer, a product isn't always the right idea. So there's lots of alternatives to building that product. You can offer just pure services, okay? Are your customers looking to buy a product or are they just looking for the results of the product? Let me say that again, because that one could be a little confusing. Are your customers looking to buy the product 
or do they want to just receive the results of the product? If they really just want the results, you may want to offer a service for that, okay? Maybe they don't actually buy the product. Maybe you use the product. Another alternative to building a product is what's called a value-added reseller or a VAR. Can you deliver the value that your customers need that you've identified by assembling existing products or existing uh, integrating existing products in a way that you can implement it for your customers in a way that's better, cheaper, faster to solve their problems? If so, maybe take that route. Third example, an alternative to building a product, maybe white label an existing product. Can you license an existing product and make it look like it's your product? Okay, that may not be what you want to hear. That might not be the most innovative way to do something, but oftentimes it's cheaper and you can deliver a very effective solution to your customers by licensing an existing product. And so we offer these alternatives in this product development journey because it is so expensive, so time consuming to build a product that we want to thoroughly vet out our uh, ideas around should we build the product are there existing products in the market that can do this? And if there's not, are there alternatives where we can provide an equal amount of value to our potential customers without actually building the product itself? Okay. So with that, we're going to pause and we're going to look at uh, the Q&A. Okay, um, one great question here. Um, when it comes to, when you, can you further elaborate on buying a product versus receiving results? Great, great topic. Um, great question on that. Um, if a customer is really only interested in receiving the results, they may not be actually interested in using the product themselves. So think about something like uh, lawn equipment, okay? If your customer just wants their lawn cut, do they really wanna buy a lawn mower or would they rather have you come over and do it for them? Depends, there's two different types of customers there. Who are you selling to? So oftentimes a lot of products find themselves where what you've sold is the results of those products, not the product itself. And so we wanna ask the questions to our potential customers. Are you really buying the results here? Can I just sell you the services? Or do you actually wanna buy the product and use the product on your own?